So today what we want to cover is we want to cover a very difficult question that someone may ask. And that is, why did Jesus have to die? Why did he have to be crucified and resurrected? What was the point of all of it? And that's a very difficult question, especially for a child to ask. But many times I've found that it is much easier to explain some of the more difficult passages in scripture by just telling a story. I love telling stories. I love telling stories out of the Bible. The Bible is filled with a lot of fantastic stories that will teach you a lot. And so what you can do a lot of times is for these kind of questions to be answered is tell a story. And then you can tell a summary of the story. And a lot of times, especially children will understand more because they've heard the story. You know, that's why we like bedtime stories and this kind of thing. So today I've asked uh, several people if they'll just come up and read the stories for us. And uh, we'll work through these stories one by one. And it will actually answer the question of why Jesus was crucified and resurrected. And we're going to answer that question with stories. So the first story we're going to look at is the Garden of Eden. And that is in Genesis chapter 3. So I'm not sure which person has Genesis chapter 3, but come on up. They're all looking, they're a little scared. <laughs> all I need to do is come up, just read it right into the microphone here for us. So this is a story, kids. You listen to this story here that Emily's going to tell us. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman, for, the God, for God knows that when you eat from, eat from it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, it was also de desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then both of the, both, then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man said to his, his wife, then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I have commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life. I will put you in enmity between you and woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. To the woman, he said, I will make your pain and childbearing severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree, about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat fr food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat plants of the field. By sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return from the ground since you were taken. From dust you are and from dust you will return. Adam had named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all living. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And the Lord said to them, This man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed him on the east side, the Garden of Eden, Cherubim, 
and flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Thank you. So we can spend, of course, weeks on this passage. And we've all heard about the Garden of Eden, right? It was a beautiful place. It was set up as a place for us, people, to enjoy the benefits of being made in the image of God. But something went wrong. Something went amiss in the garden. The way we understand it is that we could have stayed in the garden if there had been no disobedience. God said, don't do this. And as human nature, we did it anyway. So there, uh, from the very beginning, that there was a price to pay for our disobedience. Your obedience without sin could have kept you in the garden, a place of perfection. But because sin entered the world, disobedience, then we're no longer allowed to be in the garden. So we have a problem from the very beginning. Is it just like us? The very first sin entered the world through the very first man, Adam. And now we have a sin problem. And how will we overcome it? How will we overcome this problem? How will we get back into the wonderful place that we know as the Garden of Eden? So the second story that we have takes place much later. But it is a story that continues the same type of a theme that will lead us to the answer of why Jesus was crucified. So this is about Passover. And this is Exodus 12, 1 through 13. Have you ever asked that? Thank you. Thank you, Chloe. This is um, Exodus 12. Put it on the screen here. There you go. Exodus 12, 1 through 13. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, This month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share with their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. You are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with which, with what each person will eat. The animals you choose must be year-old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month, when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night, they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or boiled in water, but roast it over a fire with the head, legs, and internal organs. Do not leave any of it till morning. If some is left until morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. Um, the blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, no destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. Thank you. All right, this is the story of Passover that is found in the book of Exodus, chapter 12. So in similar vein of when we got kicked out of the garden, we have a problem with God's people. God's people were told in very clear terms, if you do what I instruct you to do, you will be fine. If you do not, you will have problems. Once again, as human nature prescribes, 
We did not follow those rules. And God's people got themselves into some very difficult situations. So difficult that they were in captivity under Pharaoh. Of course, there's many stories told about their captivity and how God miraculously brought them out. But all of those stories cultivated into one amazing miracle called the Passover. Just like it sounds, death was to pass over God's people if they were to follow the instructions that Chloe read. They got into this situation of their own accord because of their disobedience. God was going to redeem them, bring them out of captivity by how? From the blood of an unblemished, perfect lamb. How are we getting there? By, uh, by the captivity that people had placed themselves into, God was once again going to rescue them. And they had to do these things specifically the way that they were instructed or they would not make it out alive. They said, take the blood of a lamb, place it over your doorstop, door, uh, door frame, basically above your door, and the angel of death will pass over that house. And once this took place, there was much pain and anguish in that part of the world. It says God made himself known in a great judgment upon the people that held his people in captivity. Of course, and from that point on, they were brought out of captivity. So what the takeaway point here is, they were brought out of captivity because of the blood of a lamb and Jesus and the God's grace and mercy. Brought out of captivity by the blood of a lamb and God's grace and mercy. Okay. And then the third story is the Ten Commandments and the law. This comes from Exodus chapter 20. And we will read Exodus chapter 20, 1 through 21. So won't you, you two can come on up. You want to come up with her? Come on up here. You can you can help Connie read the read the verses. Thank you. Come on up. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of their parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. The Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in it. But he rested on the seventh. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and mother, so that you may live long in the land of the Lord your God in giving you, is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain and smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, Speak to us yourself, and we will listen. But do not have God speak to us, or we will die. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. God has come to test you, so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. The people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. Thank you. 
All right. That's a great testament to God's law. We have the story of the Decalogue, the Decalogue, Ten Commandments, Ten Words, as it's summarized as. Why did God see fit to give us the Ten Commandments? Yes. To keep us safe. That is exactly right. That is a very good answer. That was, you read my notes up here. That's good. The Ten Commandments were given to us to keep us safe from ourselves. Keep us away from sin. If we would only follow these Ten Commandments, we would have a much better life. So yes, the Ten Commandments serve three purposes. One, to keep us safe as a mirror to our soul. You see, when you look into a mirror, a nice, clean, perfect mirror, you see all the imperfections in yourself. And the law proved that we have to look at a perfect God that's hard to look at. But if you look at a perfect God and the perfect law, you may see lots of imperfections within yourself. But that's okay. We still should strive to keep them. The second thing that the law and the Ten Commandments do for us is it restrains evil. We have to have some rules in our society and to live as a people. Where do these rules come from? They come from the moral law, the Ten Commandments in the Bible. What teaches how to get along with one another and what a lot of times not to do. And the third thing that the Ten Commandments and the law does for us, it reveals to us what pleases God. These are the things that please God. What does it say many times in the Bible? Uh, David said, I love your law. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. We must do something. We must read the Bible and its law and the things that are to, as he said, keep us safe. This is what we must do. And so this is another example of how God loved his people, brought them out of captivity through the sea. The way was through the sea. When he parted the sea, they made through, got to the other side. He said, I'm going to give you the Ten Commandments. We must try to live by them. Were we able to live by them perfectly? No, that's correct. We were not. So we still have a sin problem. Now we're headed to Jesus. Many years after this, God became a person. And as we say, God became the law. If you ever think about that, if there had been no sin and Adam had not sinned, we would still be in the garden. Only a person that has no sin can live forever. Much of the condemnation of the garden is that we must die. And we must live a life that is hard. If there was no sin, we would live eternally. God is the only one that has not sinned, is the only one that lives eternally. So when God came to earth, from the very beginning we learned that Jesus has no sin and lives eternally. So he comes willingly to the cross to die for our sins in our problem. He becomes the person that pays the debt for what we should pay for. And only then is it set right. This is a question that Nicodemus asked in one of the most famous passages in the Bible. So turn to John chapter 3. The passages and stories that we just read, Nicodemus knew. Nicodemus was a teacher that was around during Jesus' time. He knew these stories well that we just read. He knew that there was a sin problem. He knew that something had to be done about it. He knew the law. He was in charge of teaching people about the Ten Commandments and the law and how to keep them. They were always looking for an answer. They were always looking for a way out of the sin problem in the form of the Messiah, the chosen one that was going to come from God. Who knew that would be a humble servant riding in on a donkey, right? So in chapter 3, verses 1 through 21. So Nicodemus is convicted by the things that he has seen and heard Jesus do. He has some questions. Chapter 3 of John. 
Now, there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the signs you were doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Nicodemus says, well, how can someone be born again when they're old? Surely they cannot enter a second time in their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of the water and of the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear it sound, but you cannot tell where, it, where it's going, where it comes from. So it is with everyone that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus says, well, how, how can this be, Jesus? You are Israel's teacher, Jesus said, and you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still you do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things that you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. That everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds are evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so they may see plainly what they have done has been done in the sight of God. What incredible conversation between two people. Nicodemus comes with questions. How do we get out of the sin problem? We cannot save ourselves. Jesus says you must be born again. Nicodemus is like, how is that possible? Jesus became the law and he became the sin for us. So that we may have eternal life. And Paul sums it up. In 1 Corinthians 15, 21 through 22. What's your Bible slide for that? I don't know. So 1 Corinthians 15, 21 through 22 says, For since death came through a man, Adam, that the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. So as you see the stories go through, how we started, we started in a place of perfection, sin entered the world, now we have a curse of death. Then we see as the love story progresses, we try to set things right ourselves. God says, I'm going to bring you out of captivity once again. I'm going to bring you out of your problems and your situation by the blood of the Lamb. Then we see the Ten Commandments. God says, I'm going to give you a list of things. Abide by these things and your life will be made full. Once again, it is impossible to fulfill the command. It's called the curse of the law. It's something that we love, but something that also is very difficult. And then we have everything cultivated into when the Son of Man comes to die for our sins. It's the only way out. The only way out of the sin problem is to have God himself, which is sinless, come to the earth and set it right, to make it righteous for us. So that hopefully answers in stories the question of why did Jesus have to die and resurrect for our sins? Because he became...
the blood of the Lamb for us so that we might have eternal life. So you ask yourself today, there's a couple responses today. First of all, we need to make sure we always understand the basics of our faith so we, that we may pass it along. The second thing is that if you have not dedicated your life to Jesus Christ, that opportunity is available today. If you have done that and you do not feel like you're giving 100%, then you can do what's called rededicate your life to Christ. No relationship works really well unless you're giving 100%. If you're only giving 50% in your marriage, don't expect it to be a successful marriage. You've got to give 100%. In the same way that Jesus does not ask us to give only a portion of our lives. Your relationship with God can't be something that you just do on Sunday mornings or here and there, or at Christmas or Easter. It's almost an insult to God to have that kind of a lifestyle and that kind of relationship. That's just not what he asks at all. Jesus wants 100% of relationship. That's what it talks about. You must deny yourself and take up your cross and die for Christ. And that's what he requires. What's wonderful is he gives you back your life and so much more when you make that pledge to follow him. So you have a rededication opportunity. You have an opportunity to, to dedicate your life to Christ. You have an opportunity to realize that you need to give 100% in your relationship with God. If you're not doing that, ask yourself why. You will not truly have the blessings that God has bestowed for you until you're giving your life over 100% to him. So this is a great way to tell kids what's going on in the Bible stories, what it's about with Jesus. You can use other stories throughout the Bible, throughout the Old Testament, to help lead you to the fact that we cannot solve our own problems. And God has to be the one that gave himself willingly, willingly he got on the donkey and rode into town in Jerusalem. And of course, from that point on, he angered a lot of people. Because they were saying he was the king and the Messiah. And that is not the kind of a king that they were looking for. And hence the crucifixion. But of course as you're perfect. You have eternal life. So Jesus himself there was no way. That the God of the universe was going to stay in that grave. And three days later he came out. And said because of me. You may have eternal life. Let's pray.